that's Duraldo. And then that's E, that's good. The R is in the wrong place, though, for the Stewart Theater. But really, it's the Smeraldo, backwards. So this is kind of a strange place for a punk rock drummer to end up playing serious music uh, with an orchestra and everything. But uh, I guess it comes from kind of a cross between doing film scores and remembering that I actually kind of like playing drums. And the film scores took me into orchestras and I started to write for orchestras, but they could never quite get the rhythms right. So I figured the safest way to get the rhythms right is to actually go on stage and play with them. It's kind of a cool thing because I can show up here in Italy without having to bring a band and trucks and roadies and lights. I show up with a suitcase with the scores in it. And I put the scores on the stand and count them in. Two, three, and to play. Well, we brought Ensemble Bash over from London. They're a very slick, red-hot percussion group of four crazy English guys. And the orchestra here is an Italian orchestra that we picked up. And of course, the first rehearsals sound like any first rehearsal of anything, but since the music is on the chart, it very quickly comes into focus. And the musicians are very patient and very talented, so it actually sounds pretty good by the end of the day, even though they were all dropping from exhaustion. My first instrument was a uh, trombone, and uh, the trombone seemed like it was the easiest brass instrument. My father was a trumpet player, and uh, he wanted me to play trumpet, but that's very difficult. And the uh, trombone has a bigger mouthpiece, so it's easier. But my little arms, I was seven years old, so I couldn't hit the end position on the trombone. And a few years later, I saw pictures of drums, which are much shinier and more beautiful and prettier than uh, the trombone, and there's lots more bits and pieces. So drums was more exciting, and I started to play drums instead. I must have started playing drums at age eight, something like that. And my father, who was um, a jazz musician, insisted that I have all the best teachers. But we were living in Beirut, Lebanon at the time. And uh, the best teacher in Beirut, Lebanon was an Armenian jazz player who taught me how to hold my sticks correctly and how to read music and to do the uh, 
the basic technique of, um, of the instrument. So I can say that I'm classically trained on the drums, which is a ridiculous statement, but what the hell. I guess the way the, into this was the film scoring stuff, which um, began towards the end of the police experience. I got a call from Francis Coppola, who uh, said, would I like to fly to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to talk about music for his film, Rumblefish. And uh, when you get a call from Francis Coppola, you generally take the call. And sure, I took him up on the flight to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to meet with him and the cast. And, the cast of the movie were all these people who I had never heard of. They were all these kids. Kids with names like Matt Dillon, Diane Lane, um, Mickey Rourke, Dennis Hopper, 
and uh, Nicolas Cage, who then nobody ever heard of, and they're all kid, but half of them have won Oscars by now. They're all big superstars now. And I guess that film, even though none of us understood what it was about at the time, has become kind of this seminal cult film. Um, and from that introduction into film scoring, I've actually worked out a career in doing film work. And um, for two reasons. One is because it's a more civilized life than rock and roll. Two, because every drummer has this, this urge to prove that they're an actual musician. You know, the joke uh, that musicians tell is, uh, what kind of guy likes to hang out with musicians? The answer is, a drummer. In fact, there's a whole bunch of drummer jokes.
I'm working with this ensemble, uh, Ueca, which was organized by Eugenia Busetti, the wonderful musician, all very good. And uh, it's great for me because it's always wonderful to work, you know, with music from two completely different worlds. Most of the time I do lots of classical conducting, and then a lot of times I do film work and popular work. So when you get a concert like this, it all comes together and everybody uh, enjoys it enormously. I mean, we've been having a great time. All the concerts have gotten better and better. And so now we're in Rome. Uh, we're making sort of recordings of all the concerts and plus, you know, your own film. We first met Stuart um, about eight years ago, seven years ago, when we asked him to write a piece of music for us. We had a tour of Britain, and we asked him to write a piece, which he did, and that's where we sort of started our meeting with him. We then asked him again to write another one last year, which he's done, and I can't remember where it happened, but he just one day said, wouldn't it be nice to do a concert of my music with an orchestra and you guys? which we were very happy to do. Um, and yes, yeah, so this is where we've come. We've done two of these already in Britain, in London and in Brighton. And so this is the first time we've come out of the country to, to show all Stuart's music. <laughs> The best drummers are the ones that you dance to. Uh, there are some drummers who play music that is not dance music, but you still feel a pulse in it. And that's the important thing. With Buddy Rich music, I don't really like that kind of music that much, jazz music like that, but I can listen to the Buddy Rich big band all night because his feel, his, his feel, not only his technique, but his feeling is just so um, up. It's effervescent, and it, you know, when I put it on, even my teenage kids respond to it. There's a few, there's one track um, that we play as like our family theme song. You know, it just has an energy to it. It's up. A bunch of old guys playing really hard and really furiously. Very uplifting. All these different drums here for um, this orchestral music, I have lots of drums because I need lots of different melodic elements for the playing because the music is very melodic. When I play with a rock band, I have much fewer drums. I only have one drum here and these two on the side. I don't have all these extra drums because mm -hmm. it's easier to play without all these drums in the way, believe it or not. These tom-toms here, that's for, you know, there's four of them. I used to have three drums in the front, but it's yeah. too wide like that, so the hi-hat was too far over here, and that was too far over there. So now I took the one out, out of the middle and put it down here. 
so I can yeah. get to it there, yeah. you know. Oh, okay. And when I'm playing here, that's kind of real easy to get to with my left hand, since I do a lot of work with the left hand. Young drummers all look at the way I hold the drumstick and always ask how it's possible to dray. This is, this is the traditional style, the old jazz style of drumming. And concert real musicians are supposed to play like this. And modern drummers play matched grip, which is the same, like this. And most drummers today play like that. And they have the drums angled differently so that you can play like that. But I play the old-fashioned way, the jazz style, which is from old days of the marching snare drum, which was even more angled like that. And that's what it's all about. But I learned how to play this way. It's the old jazz thing, I guess. I was just finishing up university in California, the University of California at Berkeley, and um, I was invited to join a group called Curved Air, which was at the end of their career. They had been famous maybe five years before, and this was the very end, the tiny, you know, they, they were just getting, you know, they, they had no more popularity, nobody was interested in it, but for me, it was joining a professional group with road crew, and I got my first professional drum set, and um, a big, huge, huge drum set, since the record company was paying for it. A big um, Perspex, uh, Vistalite uh, drum set. And meanwhile, I heard from the streets of London there was this new phenomenon, the punk revolution, the Clash, the Sex Pistols, the Damned. And um, the music was kind of exciting, but what was most exciting was the audience and the, the venues, the theaters, the kids were going crazy. You go and see these groups and just the audience are going nuts. And um, I looked at the band and thinking, I can do that. And uh, my brother also, Miles, he uh, looked at all the arrangements. He saw that nobody knew what they were doing. None of the, there were no record companies who understood it. The band managers had no concept of how you hire a truck how, where you get a PA for, nobody knew how to do anything. I mean, that was the whole purpose of the thing. It's to be a complete revolutionary means you don't have any telephone numbers. Uh, so Miles and I got in there and I thought of the name of a group, The Police, uh, which turned out to be a very smart move. Um, and we formed a group and I had to go find a guitarist and I found this bass player in a jazz band in Newcastle and I persuaded him. He could sing too, it was really great. There's a bass player who could sing, which means that's one less guy in the band. We could have a three-piece, which means that you can all sit in one car. Um, and later on, his name, of course, was Sting. Later on, of course, it turned out he could write songs, too. Um, but I had no idea about that. He was just a bass player who could sing a little bit in the beginning. People got this idea into their heads that the police was this an intelligent group. We were supposed to be uh, smart guys. I don't know why, but... And so when we became very famous, they started to invite us to do interesting projects. But it was very difficult in the police because you do something and then the, the police by now was a big corporation with a lot of money at stake. And you know, Sting would go do something and then they'd pull him back to the group. And I'd go do something and they'd get pulled back. And so eventually we realized that the only way to get free was to kill the golden goose.
very difficult to talk about a philosophy of music because it's so much, uh, in, it's instinct. And the more you think about it, I think the less valid it becomes somehow. Music is best when it comes from the heart rather than the brain. And after you finish playing music, you can talk about what it means, and, but that's really bullshit because what it means is how it feels. And the way to put that into any kind of expression is to play it. It is what it is. Young composers ask me, you know, how do you get into this? And of course, the hardest thing of all is getting through the first door and getting your first gig, because once you've done something, then people can look at that and say, ah, you can do it. But um, the main thing, the hardest part, the most important thing to learn about film composing is how to get the job. And the way you get the job is by you have a meeting with the director. This is providing you can get a meeting with the director, and you got to give them a concept. And the concept that always works for me it, uh, that's how I got my gig with Oliver Stone, was by you look the director in the eye and you say, your movie needs dogs. Music is too good for these people. You need dogs. I hear dogs. And the directors love this because the directors think that they want something outrageous and exciting. They all say, we really want something different. Well, they don't, actually. The, the director thinks he wants something different, but producers want the same old score so that it sounds like a movie. So I have gotten many jobs by telling the director, dogs, I hear dogs. And of course, if when a push comes to shove, I give them dogs, they go, wait a minute, I hear dogs barking, what's this? I, we want, you know, what, what's with the dogs? So the dogs is, is a way of getting the gig, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you follow through and give them dogs. In fact, Oliver Stone is the only director who, true to his word, really did want something out of the ordinary and actually used the dogs in Wall Street. In fact, if you listen closely to the score of Wall Street, there are dogs all the way through it. I have many pieces of music dedicated to my children, and I have many children. You will hear most of them tonight. Thank you.
People often say that there's only 12 notes before you get to the same notes an octave up. And from those 12 notes, only eight of them are in the key that you're playing. So, you, you know, Mozart and Jimi Hendrix only have eight notes to choose from. And so it must be that by now all the music has been written. And with drums, that's even more so because you only have a snare drum and a hi-hat and a bass drum. So surely everything's already been done. But by some miracle, that's not true. New things are coming up all the time. And um, I can't tell you what's going to be next. But the way I think to get to something new is to listen to different stuff. And um, if you're listening to me and Neil Peart and to whoever else is the guy in the front cover of the drum magazine, uh, sure, that may be interesting, but that's not how you're going to develop your own personality. The way to develop your own style is to be listening to uh, you know, the tuva singers of Mongolia or uh, Bulgarian chants or Sufi whirling dervish music or anything that nobody else is listening to. And that's how you start to get ingredients inside yourself that will make you play stuff. Even if you're not listening to drum music, just listen to other music. And I think that's how you will get an individual identity. In film composing, you get to play with an orchestra in one film, with electronica in another film, with you know strange jazz ensemble, with rock, you know, everything. Because films cover every aspect of life, you know, science fiction, uh, medieval romance, strange ethnic stuff, urban love story, urban thriller stuff. And so films have covered such a wide variety of human experience that the music that goes along with them has a wide variety as well. So unlike life in a rock band, the film composer really gets to play with just about every known form of music.
my hobby of playing drums is getting a little bigger again, but my job is film composer. And uh, I think this drumming thing might come back to get me again. from Milan before and uh, basically I uh, pull it can you give me just one minute okay okay, okay. fine okay, okay. 